This course will prepare you for JavaScript interview questions, focusing on closures, functions, and currying. Throughout the course, you'll delve into various aspects of JavaScript, such as function declarations, expressions, scopes, and hoisting, as well as learning about advanced concepts like closures and lexical scope. You'll also gain a deeper understanding of currying and its practical applications in JavaScript. Roadside Coder created this course. He has created many popular courses, both on our channel and his own channel. The course includes numerous interview style questions to help you solidify your understanding and prepare you for your next JavaScript interview. So get ready to gain the confidence and knowledge needed to tackle any JavaScript question on closures, functions, and currying that comes your way. This is the only video that you will need to know the most asked JavaScript interview questions on concepts like functions, closures, and even advanced concepts like currying. We will discuss different types of interview questions on hoisting, scope, callback, arrow function, lexical scoping, output based questions, partial application, polyfills, and much, much more. So fasten your seatbelt because in the world of JavaScript, the only thing worse than a syntax error is a silent error that breaks your code without even telling you why or where it happened. And also, if you happen to like this video and if you're interested to watch more such interview videos, you can check out my channel Roadside Coder, where I've made a complete playlist on JavaScript and React.js interview questions, which has helped hundreds of thousands of developers to crack interviews. Link to my channel will be in the description down below. So let's start by basic questions first, which are mostly asked in entry-level JavaScript interviews. So I've opened VS Code over here with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript file. And the first question is, what is function declaration? So function declaration is nothing but when we declare a function like this. So let's say function and say square and we give this a number and this returns us anything, let's say. So this is a normal function declaration. So this can also be called function definition or function statement. So next question is what is function expression? So when you store a function inside of a variable, it's called a function expression. So let's say const square and inside of it, if I add a function with no name, this will become an function expression. That's it. Now an add on to this question can be what is this called? So you see this function doesn't have a name but we are giving this a name by assigning this to a variable. But this part in itself, what is this called? This is called an anonymous function, which is which the function which has no name. And this anonymous function can be assigned to a variable or can be passed as a callback maybe. What is callback you ask? We will discuss that in this video as we go forward. Now these function expressions can also be called like just like a normal function is called like this. And oh, we need to console log this as well and need to pass a number, let's say five. And let's see, yep, we get 25 over here. So a function declaration and function expressions are kind of same, just the difference is function expressions are assigned to a variable. Now the next question is what are first class functions? Now first of all, let's understand what does this first class functions mean? So in a language where a function can be treated like a variable, their functions are called first class functions. In these cases, functions can be passed into another functions, can be used, manipulated and returned from those functions and basically everything that a variable can do, a function can also do. So this is why we call functions as first class function in JavaScript. So let me show you an example. So let's say we have the same function, function square. And we have another function, which is called display square, which takes a function and returns, or let's say just console logs that function with a message, which is a square is this. So we can call this function display square with this square function. So we can pass this function inside of this parenthesis over here and I'm gonna pass five over here. Let's see. Yep, so we get this output square is 25. So you understand how powerful functions are in JavaScript that we can pass them inside of another function just like a variable. And we can also manipulate and return them from that function. So this is called first class function. This is a very important interview question. Now the next question is what is iffy? 
Now, this is not that much of a frequently asked question, but you should be aware of what an iffy is. So iffy means immediately invoked function expressions. What do I mean by that? Let's see. So we have our square function over here. So when we need to call this square function, we need to do this square and then we pass any parameter if you want. And then it is successfully, whoops. Wait, let me, instead of returning this, let me console log this over here. Yeah, so when we call this, this is successfully invoked just like that, cool. But what an immediately invoked function expression does is we don't need this. What we can do, we can wrap this in a parenthesis and we can call it right away, right over here. We can pass a argument over here as well. And you're gonna see that our function is still called. So this is a immediately invoked function expression. Now the interviewer may not ask you exactly what iffy is, but they can definitely give you an output based question based on an iffy. So let's check out one output based question. So interviewer can give you a question like this. So what is this? Let's understand. So this is an iffy and it has another function inside of this, which is also an iffy. So here we are executing this function by passing this argument one over here, okay? We pass the argument one and then in the inner function, we are passing two, but we're not using anywhere, but we're just console logging X. And what do you think will be the output of this question? Now, a lot of people think that this will give us undefined because X is not defined in this scope, but no, it will give us the output of one. So let's see. Yep, you see, it gave us the output of one because it's gonna search X in this inner scope first. And when it doesn't find this X over here, it's gonna search in its parents scope. And in the parents scope, X exists. And this happens because of closure. If you don't know what closure is, don't worry. We will have an entirely separate video where we discuss some interview questions related to it. And that video will be dropping next. So subscribe if you haven't yet. For now, you can understand this, the ability of a function to access variables and functions that are lexically out of its scope are called closures. So closures are created whenever a new function is created because that function has the reference to its outer scope. Okay, so let's try and understand more about function scopes. So I've opened the official MDN docs for function scope in JavaScript and we can use their example to understand how exactly function scope works. So let me copy this up and paste it over here. So you can see that we have three variables defined over here. First is num1, num2, and then name. So when we call this multiply function, what's gonna happen is it's gonna take num1 and num2 from the global scope because these are defined in the global scope and not inside of this function. If there was a copy of these variables inside of this function, it would have taken that one. So let us move to the other example where we have this case. So we have this get score function over here where we have num1 and num2 as two and three. But keep in mind, we have both of those variables in our global scope as well, but these will shadow the global scope variable. So if you don't know how where let and const works, I've made a complete video on this topic and I've explained this shadowing concept as well in that video. So you can click the link in the description to watch that video. Now inside of this function, when this add function is run, it's gonna take the name from the global scope and the num1 and num2 will be taken from the, the local scope. And it's gonna return us the output, roadside coder scored five. So let's see. Also, I'll provide you the link to this page in the description below. Now, you see, first returned us 60, which was multiplication of these two, 20 and 30. And the second one returned us five with a global variable as well. So this was a basic example of a function scope. And you can use this example to explain function scope in your interviews. Now let's discuss an output based question on function scope. So we have this for loop over here. Inside of this, we have this set timeout, which console logs one and it has a delay of I into 1000 milliseconds. What do you think the output is going to be? The interviewer can ask what the output for this code is going to be. So now, since we have this let I over here, so every time this for loop runs, it creates another block scope for this function. So the first time it's going to be zero, then one, then two, then three, then four, then five. But if it was where over here, then where doesn't have a block scope, then where would have printed five, 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 five. So let me show you. 
in this case we get 5 5 5 5 5 because we have var over here but if we change this to let since let has the block scope it's gonna print 1 0 1 2 3 4 now again to understand this question properly you need to understand how let var and const works which i have explained in my another video which you can go and watch by clicking the link in the description so let's move on to hoisting now so you might remember that I've explained hoisting in our varlet const video on how variables are hoisted on top of our code before our code is executed and how our code is first initialized and then it's executed. So functions are hoisted a bit differently than a normal variable does. Now when we have a function like this and we call it over here and when we run this, you're gonna see this works absolutely fine. But what will happen if we run this before the function is declared it still runs the same it's because functions are hoisted completely so what's what happens when a variable is hoisted so let's say if we have a variable x equals 5 and when we log this we're gonna get the output as 5 but when we log this before this is even declared then obviously we're gonna get the undefined because of hoisting but in function that is not the case so let me show you if we go to sources let me put this right over here and now when we put a breakpoint over here and run this yep inside of our global scope you're gonna see we will have a variable of x which is not defined but obviously this is hoisted so if we go down you're gonna see we have this variable hoisted as undefined but in functions in the case of function the complete function is copied to the scope so if we go up over here we're gonna see we have this function name with complete function copied to our scope so hoisting works a little differently in case of functions we don't have function name as undefined we have the complete functions so it doesn't matter if you call the function before or after declaring it it's still going to work so this was our global scope right inside of a function we have the function scope and this that work exactly like global scope does so instead of global we have a function scope so let's say if we have this variable defined inside of this function over here and we console log it before it it's still going to work the same so let me show you if i put a console log over here and refresh you're gonna see inside of this local scope we still have x undefined because it was hoisted on top of this function so don't worry i'm going to discuss an output based question which is going to clear on how interviewers can ask you these type of tricky concepts and understand if you have the knowledge for the same so if you put a debugger over here and move forward now you're going to see x has five because obviously x is defined now all right pause if you're not yet following me on twitter go to twitter.com slash piyush underscore eon or click the link in the description down below and hit that follow button right now i'm waiting for you I'm still waiting. Okay, fine. Let's continue with the video. So we have an output based question over here on function hoisting. So I need you to think about it before answering it because this is a little tricky one. So we have a var x as 21 over here. We have a function expression defined over here and then we are calling that function expression. So what do you think? What is going to be the value of x over here? Is it going to be the local variable or is it going to be the global variable? A lot of us we will think that obviously it's going to be local variable right because this is how this works we will take the local variable because the local variable will shadow the global variable okay fine but a lot of people will think no this is not defined at this moment this is defined after that right so this is obviously take the variable from the global scope okay that makes sense as well but let's see what is going to be the output for this it's going to be undefined why why is this undefined let's see let's go to our sources inside of our script.js and here let's run this so we have this global scope right in our global scope we have x right over here x as 21 but inside of our local scope 
we have x already present so if you remember in our var let const video i explained hosting is a two step process first it initializes the complete code so it's gonna initialize the global scope then it's gonna come to the local scope and then it's going to initialize the local scope as well and when it initializes the local scope it's gonna first hoist this variable on top of this scope so in this scope the x is present and is undefined right now so we will not take 21 or 20 we will take the x in this current scope because obviously x is not being initialized at this moment so when i put a debugger over here and press next now you're gonna see we have x as 20 so keep this in mind when we have a variable present in a scope we will not go and check the global scope we will always refer to the current scope so our next question is params versus arguments so this is one topic that confuses a lot of people which of these is called params and which of these is called the argument. So when we have a function like this declared over here and when we call the function, the values that we pass inside of here are called arguments. So these are arguments. And when we receive those values inside of our function, this is called params or parameters. So these are called params and this is called the argument. Pretty simple, isn't it? Now interviewers can ask a confusing output based question on this topic as well. I'm going to discuss another bonus topic in this video, which is spread versus rest operators. So let's say we have a function called multiply and we have number one and number two. We call this like this. All right. So what is a spread operator when we let's say we have an array over here um, let's say five comma six and we want to pass both of these values to this function we're gonna what we're gonna do we're gonna use these three dots and arr so it's gonna spread both of these values and pass it to this function so now you're gonna see that this runs just like that and it gives us the output 30 and similarly when we're passing this to this function we can also receive it like this let's say nums and let's just console log nums for now you're gonna see that we receive 5 comma 6 so here when we use this operator this is called spread operator and here when we use this operator this is called rest operator so i can probably do something like num of 0 into nums of 1 and it's gonna give us the same output yep just like that so let's discuss a tricky output based question on this. So let's say the interviewer gave us this code snippet and asked us what is going to be the output for this. So when we run this, so let's see the output. Rest parameter must be the last formal parameter. So you see, we combined params, arguments and rest operator concepts and we have this question over here. So when we use rest operator or spread operator, it should always be the last one. So just like this. So what this will do is it will take all of these three values. So let me add more values over here, comma, eight, comma, nine. So this will take a x, a, a x, y as five, six, three, and the numbers will take the remaining values. So that's why we add it at the last of our list of parameters so that it takes all of the remaining arguments. So if I say numbers, and now you're going to see it runs properly up six, three and seven, eight, nine. So six, three and seven, eight, nine, which were the remaining arguments. Great. So I know this was a little tricky one if you are not aware of uh, rest operator or spread operators, but it's fine. You're going to get good with time as you use this rest operator, spread operators in your projects and in your apps. So the next question is what is a callback function? So actually we have already seen this in our first class function topic. So let me go to the official Mozilla documentation. And here in the de definition, you can see a callback function is a function passed into another function as an argument, which is then invoked inside the outer function to complete some kind of routine or action. So as I mentioned, functions are first class function in JavaScript. So when we have a function like this, and a function like this, we are passing this greeting inside of this function and it's taking this greeting callback. So this greeting is what a callback function is. So as the name suggests, 
the function says that you can call me back whenever you like so the function is sending itself to this function and it is calling it inside of this other function so this is exactly what a callback function is all about now interviewer can ask you question like can you give us an example on what a callback function is so you can give that example and also you can give the example inside of the javascript predefined functions which are something like set timeout map filter reduce so let me give you an example something like when we use event listener so document add event listener this takes two things it takes the event which let's say click event and then it takes a callback over here just like that so this is what a callback is when we are passing a function inside of another function and then this function is manipulated inside of this one so it can be event listeners it can be function like map filter reduce or set timeout so if you don't know i've made a actually made a, another video on map filter reduce as well which is our previous video you can click the link in the description to understand these topics thoroughly now last but not the least we have arrow functions now what are arrow functions so arrow functions were introduced in es6 version of javascript and they were kind of like similar to a normal function but in some ways they work differently so let me show you if you see a normal function its syntax looks something like this so we have a function called add over here in which we takes two parameters and return some value so what are we going to do if we need to convert this function into an arrow function so we just need to get rid of this function keyword and we need to add an arrow over here and that's it we're done that is what an arrow function is it has a bit more clean syntax and actually we can get rid of these curly braces as well since this is returning only one line and we can get rid of this return as well over here so yep you can see this syntax looks much cleaner than the previous syntax but when we use the curly braces we do need to use return or i mean according to our requirements so let's discuss some of the differences between arrow function and a normal function because this is a really important interview question so the first one is what we have already discussed is the syntax so the syntax of a normal function looks something like this with the function keyword but the syntax of an arrow function looks something like this with this arrow operator okay now the second difference the implicit return keyword so i've already showed you that in a normal function we can use return like this but in an arrow function we can do something like we can get rid of return function if this is a one liner and we can write something like this third point would be is the arguments keyword so if let me show you so if we have a function inside of this bit let's say we have we don't have any parameters and we just console log arguments over here now if i call this function with one comma two comma three whatever so then we're gonna see oops a square has already been declared let me use these names okay now you're gonna see we get this arguments with all of these arguments so we didn't even pass the parameter over here but we got all of the arguments just like this but can we do this in arrow function let's see function keyword and make it a arrow function now let's see you're gonna get the output arguments is not defined so you cannot have the arguments keyword inside of an arrow function okay let's comment this out as well now the fourth point will be the this keyword how does this keyword perform with normal function and the arrow function now obviously if you don't know what this keyword is don't worry i'll create another separate video on this topic so let me have a question over here which can be considered as an output based question so interviewer can give you something like this so inside of this object we have a username and we have two functions over here first function is an arrow function and second function is a regular function so let's see how both of these performed i have called both of these functions over here and let's see the output so the first arrow function gives us subscribe to and undefined but the second regular function gives us subscribe to roadside coder it's because this here is pointing to this object but this inside of this function is pointing to the global object 
So I know if you don't have the proper knowledge of this keyword, it's hard to understand right now, but don't worry, I will come up with a separate video for this keyword. So yeah, these were the major four differences between arrow function and a regular function. Now there can be more differences as well, like how the constructor is defined inside of both of these, but that would be a little advanced topic for this video. So I would highly recommend you to go and read more about it. And if you haven't accessed the complete playlist for our JavaScript interview series, you can go to youtube.com slash roadside coder and here inside the playlists, you're going to find the complete playlist here in this playlist tab section. All right, now let's move on to our next topic, which is on closures. Closures is the most important topic for JavaScript interviews and there can be literally hundreds of questions that can be made on it. That's why after hundreds of years of research, I have curated some of the most asked interview questions on closure for this video. Uh, just kidding, I haven't researched for that long, but it's gonna be good. So a closure is a function that references variables in the outer scope from its inner scope. To understand the concept of closures, you need to know how the lexical scoping works first. So I've opened VS Code over here with basic HTML, CSS and JavaScript files. So what is lexical scope? So a scope refers to the current context of your code. It can be either globally or locally defined. And with the ES6 version of JavaScript, we also have the block scope as we discussed in our var let const video. So let's see. So since we have a variable right over here, this variable, this is in the global scope, right? But what if we go on and create a function over here? Let's call it local. And so this right here is the local scope. And this is the global scope. But what exactly is the lexical scope? So a lexical scope in JavaScript means that a variable defined outside a function can be accessible inside of another function defined after a variable declaration. But the opposite is not true the variable defined inside the function will not be accessible outside that function. So let's see an example. So if I console log this name over here, let's call it username. Yeah. So let's go on and run this. Here's a browser. Let's go to inspect. Oops, we are not calling this function any right now. So yeah, now let's see. Yep. You see, we get this uh, output roadside coder over here because the variable defined outside of this function can be accessible inside of this function. This is called lexical scope. But what if we do this? If we take this line and put it over here and try to take this console log outside of this function, will this still work? Let's see. No, this is going to give us the error. Username is not defined. So we cannot access the variables from inside of the function. We can only access the variables that are outside of this local scope. So let's see another example over here. So we have this function subscribe over here, which we are calling after it. And we have another function display name, which we are calling inside of this function. So you see, we have multiple scopes over here. So let's call it inner scope. We'll call it inner scope two and then there is this global scope right so we have three scopes over here so what's going to happen is when we call this subscribe function over here it's going to initialize this function with this name roadside coder and when we go inside of this function this will be still accessible inside of this function because it's outside of this local scope right so we will be able to print this name so let's see yeah you see it's printed over here so this thing exactly right here is what a closure is. The display name is called a closure. I know you might be a little confused right now, but let's go on and understand closures in depth. Also, if you would like to get in depth knowledge about JavaScript functions, you can go and check out my previous video, which was completely on functions, where we discussed all of the interview questions related to the functions in JavaScript. All right, so let's go to the Google and search closures and we get this MDN docs over here. And according to this documentation, a closure is a combination of a function bundled together with references to its surrounding state or the lexical environment that we just discussed. In other words, a closure gives you the access to an outer function scope from an inner function. So as we saw in this code, that this function was able to access the variable outside of this scope. So this is what a closure exactly is. In JavaScript, closures are created every time a function is created. So you can see right here, this is the example that we discussed. 
So if we scroll further down, they've given us another example. So let me just copy this up and paste it right here. So what's going on over here? Let's see. Uh, instead of this alert, I'm just going to put console log over here. Yeah. So here we have defined this local variable name. And inside this, we have this function, inner function called display name. And we are returning this display name over here. So what we're doing is we are calling this make function over here and we're taking whatever that it's returning us. So it is, it is returning us this display name. So now this gives us a function which we can call anytime we want. This is the inner function of this make function. So we can go on and call this and it's going to execute this function right here and it's still going to access its outer variable of Mozilla. So if you go to the browser and see, yep, you see Mozilla is printed right here. And in some of the language, you wouldn't see this type of code working. But in JavaScript, this works. In JavaScript, every time we create a new function, it binds itself to its environment or its lexical scope. So it doesn't matter if you call this one directly over here or if you return it from this function, it's still going to have the access to its parent scope of this or, or let's say global scope. So it's still going to have the access to the lexical scope of its parents. So you must be thinking, what's the use of this syntax? So closures makes it possible for a function to have private variables. JavaScript closure is used to control what is and isn't in the scope of a particular function, along with which variables are shared between sibling functions in the same containing scope. So if I create another function right here, with some another name and return that one as well. So that will also have the access to the scope of this function. So actually we will discuss all of these questions and concepts as we move forward in this video. I just want to make sure that your basics are cleared at this moment first. So we're going to start one by one. Also, if you want to call this function display name, we can also do this. So let me remove this up. We're calling this function and inside of this, since this is, this returns us another function, we can do this right over here. So this returns us the display name and then we are calling the display name right over here, just like that. So actually we can pass anything inside of here as well. So let's see first this works or not. Yep. This works as expected. So let me pass number five over here and let's receive num and I'm going to print num. So. Yep, you see number five is also printed over here. So this just works just like a normal function, but we have much more power because of this JavaScript closures on our scope. Okay, so that were the basics of closures, but you might have heard of this term called closure scope chain. Let's see, let's go to the documentation again and see what this thing is. So right here. So according to this, every closure has three scopes as we already discussed, a local scope that is this one, the outer function scope, that is this one, the outer function scope, and then the global scope. So it has three scopes right here. So a lot of people think that, okay, this function will only have the access to its outer scope and not the scope of the parent. What scope chain means is, is it's going to have the access to its outer scope as well and the scope of its parent. So if I go on and say where user name and give it a value and use this right over here, then you're going to see we still get the output because it has the access to all of the scopes of its parent scope and the scope of its parent's parent. So this is what a scope chain is. Let's see what example they've given us to explain it. So as you can see right here, they have given us this example with a lot of local scopes in here. So let's paste it. Okay, so as you can see, we have this function here and then we have another function nested, then we have another function nested and we have this sum at the top. So we're calling this sum with one, right? So it's going to give this a one and then another inside of this, we have another function return. Okay, so this will return B. Now we're supposed to call B over here. So then we are calling B with this parenthesis and we're supplying the value of two to B. Also, sorry, the name of function is not B. The name of parameter is B. The function is an anonymous function, right? So after that, it's returning us another anonymous function. This will be returned over here. So now we're going to call it again with value three. So it's going to have three and so on. It's going to return another function. So we're calling it with this function four. And now notice what happens. 
inside of it we're returning a b c d e so this function right here will have the access to all of the scopes outside of it so a scope where we have c value b value a value and the global scope where we have e value so it's gonna be able to access all of them and it's going to log us 20 so let's find out yep just like that so this is what a closure scope chain is all about now they've given a bunch of more examples i would highly recommend you to go and read more about closure and closure scope chain from this documentation it's gonna really help you become good in this topic okay so let's go on and discuss some of the most asked interview questions on closures we're gonna start from the very basics and go to the advanced level questions so as you can see right here we're given a variable let count equal zero and after that we have an iffy over here so if you don't know about what an iffy is you can go and watch our previous video on functions there i've explained what an iffy is and right so we have a function over here called print count and inside this we have this conditional and we're supposed to tell that what this will console log and what this will console log so okay we have count equal zero so obviously it's gonna take count equal zero inside this function as we learned up until this video because of its lexical environment or lexical scope but we have a problem over here we have another count equals one over here well this is confusing what will we print inside of this count then will we print count equals one or count equals zero okay so let's see so this is checking if count is equals to zero which yep it at this point it is zero so we're gonna go inside of this then we're, we're saying that let count equals one now this concept right here this is called shadowing and i've explained this concept in our var let const video that this is a block scope right here and this variable is going to shadow this variable from outside so this is going to overlap the value of count with one and it's going to print one over here but outside of this keep in mind this is inside of this block only it's not going to affect the environment outside of it so outside of it count is still zero so count is still zero at this point so this will print zero it will not be affected by this let count equals one so let's see the output yeah you see first one gave us one and the other one gave us zero so interviewers give us questions like this to understand if the candidate is aware of concepts like block scope or shadowing or not. Okay, so the next question is to write a function that would allow you to do this. Okay, so what's going on over here? We are calling this create base function with certain value and it is returning us a closure called add six. And then we are calling this add six closure and whichever value that we pass inside of it, it returns us by adding the value that was written over here. So if we did 10, so 10 plus 6, 16, 21 plus 6, 27. Okay, so how are we going to do that? What we learned up until now, this is obviously going to be a closure which will be returned from this create base function. So let's create uh, this create base function first. So create base and it's going to take a number cool now from inside of this we are supposed to return a function so let's return a function which i'm gonna keep as anonymous function and this i'm gonna give let's say inner num and so inside of this what we're supposed to do we're supposed to add inner num to this num so we're gonna return inner num plus num and obviously since this is a closure so num will be accessible inside of this function so let's see if this works or not oh i think i should console log this or maybe i think i should console log this and put this inside of here yep let's see okay we got this output 16 and 27 so what's happening over here is we have taken this create base as 6 and we have created uh, local scope for both of these function calls so we just have to do this once and this will be initialized with a scope where num is 6 now doesn't matter what we pass inside of over here if we pass 15 over here it's still going to add 6 to it just like that so what's happening over here is you can create a closure to keep the value passed to a function create base even after the inner function is returned so if we don't want this value to change then we can create a closure where this value is always six we just have to pass it once and it's going to access the value as only six so this is also one of the use case of closures which makes it so powerful 
ओके सो दिस क्वेश्चन राइट हेयर इज काइंड ऑफ सिमिलर टू द प्रीवियस क्वेश्चन बट इट्स अ लिटिल एड ऑन टू दैट हाउ कैन वी यूज क्लोजर टू ऑप्टिमाइज द टाइम ऑफ आर कोड सो इंटरव्यूअर हैज गिवन अस दिस फाइंड फंक्शन वेन वी कॉल दिस फाइंड फंक्शन राइट हेयर बाय दस्ट इग्नोर दिस कॉन्सोल डॉट टाइम फॉर नाउ आई हैव जस्ट एडेड दिस टू मेजर हाउ मच टाइम डज दिस फंक्शन कॉल टेक्स ओके सो फर्स्ट वी आर कॉलिंग दिस फाइंड फंक्शन विद दिस सिक्स वैल्यू ओके सो इट टेक्स दिस सिक्स वैल्यू राइट हेयर एंड इट हैज द एम टी एर ए and what it's doing over here we we have a really long loop which runs 1 million times and what it's doing over here is it's assigning the value of i into i to each of the index of this array okay that's fine so this is being done to make this loop really slow and then we are console logging the index whatever index that we provide so if we have provided the six index so we are just supposed to print that okay so let's save this and check this out okay so you can see right here it gives us this output but it's taking this 6 millisecond right here and the other call takes 12 milliseconds if we put even higher number over here let's say uh 50 so it's taking 135 millisecond right here sorry i said uh, 6 earlier but it's 67 milliseconds for this one and this is 135 milliseconds for this one so how can we optimize this by using closures so just like what we did in our previous since we are not touching this value any time right we this value is the same for each and every time we call this function so let's create a function right here an anonymous function which will take this console log inside of it and instead of passing this index over there we're going to pass this index over here so let's do this let's create um const closure which will have this find right here so we have just created a inner function closure for us so that this remains the same for every time we call this closure right here so now i'm going to replace this with this closure and this is 50 right here so i'm going to put 50 so we can recognize this okay so let's see what has changed okay there is a huge change right here so for 6 i think it was 67 earlier but now it's 0.25 milliseconds there's a huge time optimization of this code and for 50 it was i think 100, 135 something but now it's 0.025 so you see how closure has helped us in optimizing the time for our code so this is the reason why closure is such an important topic and such a favorite topic of interviewers Okay so let's move on to our fourth question which is on block scope and set timeout with closures. So this question is really really important and, and this question is asked in a lot of companies. I've already discussed this question in my unacademy interview experience video. So I'm going to go on and play that clip for you right here. So the interviewer provided me with this code snippet and obviously we're going to run this over here. So he asked me what is going to be the output for this. So let's think about it. most people will think that since we are console logging over here we are running a loop over here for loop and we are console logging each of these values inside of over here after 1 second each so most people will think that the output is going to be this 0 1 2 is it let's find out it is 3 3 three times let's refresh the page so 3 3 and 3 after 1 second each So why is this happening? This is because of where. So what where does is we just discussed in our previous question. So where doesn't have a block scoped. Where has a function scoped. So what's happening over here is first time this runs where's value is 0. But this is not going to be printed right away because set timeout only runs after the complete code has ran successfully. right so this is not going to run so we have a reference to that i variable in our memory so we have a reference over here let's say okay then again the i is 1 then we again have a reference to the i variable just like that and then i is 2 then we again have a reference to i variable and then the third time the value of i is 3 but if we obviously we won't go inside of over here since it says that i has to be less than 3 so we're not going to run inside of it we come out of this loop and then set timeout has finished its time and now our js engine is going to print all of these values so last time the js engine encountered the value of i it was 3 now here js engine is referring to the current value of i so the current value of i was 3 so it's going to print 3 3 and 3 just like that now what's the solution for this you may have guessed it right the solution for this is using let instead of where 
let's see the output 0 1 2 yes so what's happening over here is let is block scoped so first of all let's value was 0 so it has the completely different scope so in this scope the value of i was 0 so it's going to print it later on then again the second value of i was 1 so again th after the complete code has ran successfully it's going to look into the scope of that i variable and when it looks into all the three scopes it's going to find 0 1 and 2 so this is the logic behind this question so actually this was the follow up question that the interviewer asked i just explained it to you in one go so these were two different questions that the interviewer asked the interviewer asked first to tell him the output of the first with where and then he asked me how we can print 0 1 2 so then i went on and explained him with let so this was the question but few of the interviewers extend this question even more they're gonna say you're not allowed to use let you're gonna have to use where instead of let and you have to print 0 1 2 you have to give this output how are we gonna do that so this is a task for you all i'm gonna give you a small hint it's gonna use closures all right pause if you're not yet following me on Twitter, go to twitter.com slash Piyush underscore Eon or click the link in the description down below and hit that follow button right now. I'm waiting for you. I'm still waiting. Okay, fine. Let's continue with the video. Okay, so in the end of that clip, I asked you a question that how will you do this just by using where? How will you print 0, 1, 2, 3 by using where only instead of let? So how will you do that? You're gonna use closures so we're gonna create a closure over here let's say inner and it's gonna take i as a local variable and i'm gonna put all of this inside of this closure and we will call this inner closure and pass the i to it so what's gonna happen is every time this i is passed to this function it is not going to reference just like we discussed it's not going to reference that particular memory value. It's going to create a whole different memory space for this function right here for every time this loop runs. So we're passing i over here and now i will be a local variable inside of this function rather than taking it from our outer scope. So let's run this and yep, you can see we get this output 0, 1, 2. Awesome. So the next question is how would you use a closure to create a private counter? So what is a private counter? Let me show you. So if we create a function right here called counter and we don't take anything inside of it and we have a variable counter equals zero. So I've put underscore over here because this is a convention when we create private variables we put underscore before that. You don't have to follow this but it's a good practice. So how can we create a private counter? So we already know that we can't access this variable outside of this function, right? So how are we going to update it? So I'm going to create a bunch of functions inside of it. First one will be the add, which takes an increment variable. By how much value is this going to be incremented? So this is going to return increment. So it's going to add this increment to this counter. And you know what? We don't need this return statement. My bad. So we're just going to do this. It's just going to add this increment to counter. Cool. Then we'll have another function which will retrieve the value of counter. Just gonna say return counter counter equals and I'm gonna provide the counter just like that. Now we're gonna return both of these functions. So I'm gonna return add and retrieve just like that. Cool. So let's go on and initialize this counter right here. So I'm going to say const c equals counter. So this has created a new counter, a private counter. So what we can do is we can say c dot add and we can provide it value. Let's say five. So it's going to add five to that counter. And let's say if we provide it value, let's say 10. So after this, the counter should be at 15, right? So let's go on and call retrieve and check. So let's see in our browser. Um, okay, I think, oh yeah, we're supposed to console log this since it's returning the value. All right, so counter equals 15. 
So this is what a private counter is. We are not directly manipulating the counter. We are using these functions right here to manipulate the value of this private variable or a private or the private counter. Now there's a similar concept which relates to this one, which is called a module pattern, which we're going to discuss in our next question. So Intuver can ask you this question that what is a module pattern? So a module pattern looks something like this. So we have a ify right here and we have a private function inside of it and we have a public function which we are returning to the user. So user can make use of this public function and this public function we can write a code inside of it which can call this private method right here or the private methods or private variables of this module right here. So they will not be accessible outside of this module pattern. So private functions are not returned. Not returning these functions makes them inaccessible outside of the module namespace. But our public function can access our private functions which makes them handy for like helper functions. For example, if we are supposed to make an uh, API call inside of it but we don't want the user to access it directly so we can just use our public method to let's say manipulate it in some way so that it works exactly as the developer wants it to work. So in these cases module pattern helps us a lot. So let's say if we go on and console log public and we put this inside here called private module dot public method and we called module dot private method so this will be called but this will give us error so let's see yep this is called and this gives us module dot private method is not a function because it's not going to be returned from that function cool i would highly recommend you to go and read more about module pattern on your own because this can be a really important question and sometimes it's also asked in junior interviews but mostly in the senior developer interviews okay so next question is that interview provided us this function like the video like the video and inside of it we have this variable view so view is defined outside we have declared view variable outside and we are initializing it inside of our function and then we are console logging it so the question is to make this run only once so if we call this function and again and again you're gonna see that we get this output again and again so what can we do to make this run only once so obviously we're gonna make use of closures so we're gonna create a local variable inside of it let's let called it's going to be zero by default and inside of this i'm going to create a new function i'm going to return a new function it's going to be an anonymous function and inside of this i'm going to check if called is equals to zero then you know what i'm going to say if called is more than zero then obviously this is already called so i'm going to console log already subscribe to roadside coder and i hope you are also subscribed to roadside coder otherwise else if this is not more than zero then we're gonna take this code and put it right over here and after this is console log i'm gonna say called plus plus so that called is not zero anymore and then we will print already subscribe to roadside coder so I think this should work first time they should print subscribe to roadside coder and then after that it should print already subscribed. Let's see. Oops, my bad. I need to call it first. So I'm going to say let I'm just going to remove this for now. I'm going to say is subscribed. And it's going to take like the video. And now we can call this. So by doing this, what we did is we created a local scope with let called equal zero and every time we call this it's gonna reference to the same called variable so let's call it bunch of times and let's see so the first time it printed subscribe to roadside coder and after that it printed already subscribe to roadside coder yeah so this is what we exactly wanted which will make this run only once now this is not the proper implementation of this once but you can use it if the interviewer asks you to do something like this. But if interviewer asks you to create a more generic function then how are you going to do that? Let's see. So actually there's a library called Lodash which already has an implementation of this once function.
function. So I'm gonna go on and create the polyfill for this once function right here. Okay, so let's create a more of a generic function. So I'm gonna create a function with the name of once and it's going to take two things. It's going to take a function and it's going to take a context, a local context if there's any context there. Now inside of this, we're gonna create a local variable called ran and I'm just gonna declare it like that, which will determine if this function has been ran once or not. And after that, I'm gonna create a closure, which is gonna be an anonymous function. And inside of this, I'm gonna check if there's something inside of the function, then go inside of it. And ran will be function dot apply. And I'm gonna provide the context. If the context is provided, otherwise, I'm just gonna provide the this. That is whatever the context of this function is. I'm just gonna point to that one by using this. Don't worry, I've, as I've already mentioned that I'm gonna bring a complete video on this implicit and explicit binding, which will cover this, this variable and call, apply, bind, all of these concepts. So don't worry, that video is coming very soon. So all this apply does is, all you need to understand for now, that it's giving our function a new context and the arguments, if any. So I'm gonna pass all of the arguments and as you know, this arguments will be an array. So I would uh, highly recommend you to go and read about this apply function if you don't understand how this works because that will be a little out of scope for this video. So all it's doing over here is it's providing it a new context and a bunch of arguments. Let's say if we have one comma two comma three, it's gonna provide it just like that. Now after this is now after this runs, it's gonna provide the output to this ran variable and I'm gonna put the function to null so that we can not call it again. And after that, we're gonna return null. Oops, return ran, just like that. And this is our once function right here. Don't worry, I'm gonna run this and I again explain you how this exactly works. So let's say I have variable hello, which is a function, which console logs hello. So how are we supposed to run this only once? So if I print this multiple times, you're gonna see that it runs multiple times, okay. But when we wrap this inside of this once function that we have created right here, then you're gonna see that it runs only once. It's not gonna run again and again. It doesn't matter how many times you call it. So what's happening over here is it takes this function over here okay cool now inside of this we have a closure which will be returned inside of this variable the reason how we're able to call this and then we're checking it if the function has some value yes it has this value then we are running this function and after we run this it's gonna have the result inside this ran variable and function will be null so that we can't run this again and then we simply return the output of this function but what if we had some variable, some arguments? So let's say if I pass one comma two. So let's take a comma b right here, and I'm gonna print a comma b. And check this. Yep, you see, it's gonna run with the provided arguments because we are providing the arguments right here. So this is how once function is supposed to work. Now for our next question, we have to create the polyfill of this memoize. So what is memoize? So this question was also asked to me during one of my previous interviews. This question was asked to me during my cast 24 interview, which I've already discussed in that video. So I'm going to show you that clip right here. The next question was on implementing a caching or a memoize function in JavaScript. So for example, if you are given with this function, which has some expensive calculation inside of it, which when executed every time takes a decent amount of time to run. So if I go on and run this, so I'm gonna use console.time to measure how much time did this took to run. And I'm gonna run it twice actually with the same parameters. Okay, so if I go to console, you're gonna see first time it took 40 milliseconds and second time is also to second time it was 42 milliseconds. So how do we minimize this time calculation? If the parameters of the function are same, we need to cache the, the result of the previous function somewhere, right? So that is what we are going to implement. So let's say I'm gonna go over here at the top and I'm gonna have function which I'm gonna say my memoize and it's going to take a function which we are supposed to memoize and we're gonna take a context, 
Uh, you know what? Let me remove this context for now. I'm gonna show you how we're gonna use that later. So right now we're just gonna take a function in this memoize. And first of all, let's create a variable for storing our result. So const res equals an empty object. So this will be the place where the result for our previously executed function will store or the cache for our function, right? Then after this, I'm gonna return a function. And inside of this, I'm gonna take the arguments from the user after making this a memoized function. Now, first of all, I'm gonna convert all of these arguments that we get from this function into a string. So I'm gonna say where args cache equals json dot stringify and instead of this i'm going to provide the args so what's going to happen is this args cache will contain all of these arguments now we're going to take this args cache and check if we already got these arguments in our cache or not and if we already got a result for all of these arguments so i'm going to go down and say if i'm going to check inside of the res so res args cache so if we don't have these arguments inside of our object, then we're gonna calculate the result for that function. Otherwise, we're just gonna return what we already have. So return this thing, just like this. So we're gonna return all of the result for that object. For, so for example, if we are providing five and six, so our result object will look like this. So let's say a result of 30. Right, so this is how our res object will look like. And if it finds out that it already has those parameters, so it's just gonna return us this value. So let me write the logic for that. So inside of over here, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna add that inside of our res object. So res args cache will contain the result of the logic for that function. So function dot call. And now over here, we are going to use that context. So if we are sending any context, I'm just gonna provide it. So obviously this context is going to be optional. So that's why I'm gonna say if this context doesn't exist, just use the current context. And obviously we are going to use these arguments that are being sent to us. So I'm just gonna spread all of these args as well over here. Cool, so I think this looks good to me. Um, let's go on and use this. So again, I'm gonna show you. Previously, it gave us this result, both of these times. But now if I go on and memoize this function, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna supply this function. You know what, first of all, let me change the name of this function. I don't think this fits the appropriate, so this should be clumsy product. That fits better. Yeah, so after this, I'm gonna say const memoize and I'm gonna wrap that function. So I'm just gonna take this my memoize and wrap this clumsy product, just like this. And now since it's going to return us with a function, as you saw over here, return this function. So we are going to get a function inside of this over here. So I'm just gonna replace this clumsy product with our newly memoized clumsy product. So now let's find out if it worked or not. Yep, awesome. So you see in the first call, it gave us 49 milliseconds and in the second call, it was 0 0.08 milliseconds. Oops, my bad, I made a mistake over here. So the else is not going to be over here. So this is just going to be returned. So it's just gonna check, since so this is an optional condition over here, it's gonna check if, it's not, if it doesn't exist inside of this array, then just add it to our result and then return it. Otherwise, if it is inside of our result object then just return it directly so now you're gonna see yep now we get both of these result over here awesome so this is how you go on and implement a caching or a memoization function in javascript so this is a really important interview question all right so our next question which can also be very frequently asked is the difference between closure and scope so whenever you create a function within another function then the inner function is the closure this closure is usually returned so we can use the outer functions variable at a later time. So this is what a closure is. Whereas a scope in JavaScript defines what variable you have access to. There are two kinds of a scope as we already discussed, global scope and local scope. And in case of closures, there are global scope, outer scope and local scope. So yeah, you can give this answer in your interviews and that should be good enough. And these were all of the interview questions related to the closure. 
All right, now let's move on to our next topic, which is going to be on curing. And this is a very important section of this video because you need to give me your full attention to understand this topic because some people might find this topic a little bit overwhelming, but this is very important for our JavaScript interviews. While preparing for this video, a lot of interviewers told me that currying is the topic whose questions are the one a lot of candidates fail to answer just because they don't know how it exactly works or don't have their basics right. So what is this currying anyway? Currying is a function that takes one argument at a time and returns a new function expecting the next argument. It is a conversion of functions from callable as this into callable as this. And curried functions are constructed by chaining closures by immediately returning their inner function simultaneously. So if you haven't watched the last video of this series which was on closures, you can watch that video by clicking on link in the description or i button above. Now don't worry if you're unable to understand what I just explained, by the end of this video you'll be able to answer most of the questions that can be formed on currying. So let's understand it with an example. Okay, so I've opened VS Code over here with basic HTML, CSS and JavaScript files. And let's understand currying with this simple example. So as I mentioned, we have a function f with params a comma b and it prints a comma b. So when we convert this type of normal function into this type of format, this is called currying. So let's see how we can do that. So instead of writing this, we can write a function f with param a. And as I mentioned, in currying, a function takes one argument at a time and returns a new function expecting the next argument. So we're going to return a new function. We're going to keep it as anonymous function with no name and with the B parameter. And inside of this, we're just going to simply console log a comma B just like before. Okay, let's try to run this. I'm going to console log function with value five. Let's see what do we get when we run this much of the code. So let me run this by opening with live server. There we go. Let's go to the console. And in the console, you can see we get another function over here. So how do we run this? We can go over here. And since this is returning us a function, what we can do is we can call it just like this with something else. So let's say if I enter six over here, let's see what do we get but you know what uh, instead of this i'm just gonna say return with a and b just like that so and without this we get this function returned to us so yeah, this is how currying works this is how we convert a normal function into a function which is curried there can be a lot of levels to this we can have more parentheses over here just like this. So it depends on how deep the currying is. And we're going to discuss all the types of questions that interviewers can ask you during the interview process. Now, there's an interview question where interviewer can ask you, why do we use currying? So there can be a lot of answer to this question. To avoid passing the same variable again and again, to create higher order functions, to make your function pure and less prone to errors. So actually this is more of a theory question. So instead of making this video too long, I've written a blog on currying, which you can check out by clicking the link in the description below and follow along with this video. In that blog, I've included a lot of theory questions and all of the interview questions that I'm going to discuss in this video as we move along. So definitely go and check out that blog with link in the description below. All right, so let's get down to our first question, which is how will you implement this sum function like this? And what this function should do is this function should sum all of the parameters that are provided to this parenthesis. So this is actually very similar to the example that I discussed a few minutes ago. So I will highly recommend you to go and try this question yourself first. So pause the video right now and try this question yourself and then continue with this video. So I hope you were able to solve this question. Let's go and understand how we can do this. So as I explained to you, we have a function first. Let's go from scratch. So how I would explain this question to the interviewer is, so I'll go and explain by creating a normal function first, sum with three parameters, let's say a, b and c, and return a plus b plus c, just like that. And if we go and console log this, sum let's say two comma six comma one so we'll obviously get the output nine but how do we implement it just like this 
So right below this, actually, I'm going to comment it out first. Yeah, below this, I'm going to create another function, sum, which takes a. And inside of this, as we already discussed, incurring a function takes one argument at a time and returns a new function expecting the next argument. We're going to create a new function, which will give us another argument. So I'm going to create a function, an anonymous function with parameter of b. And after that, I'm going to create, since we have another uh, parameter over here, another parenthesis. So I'm going to return another function with C. Oops, C. And inside of this, finally, we can return our answer, which is going to be A plus B plus C. Now, if we go on and run this, sum A, I mean, 2 and then 6 and then 1 and go and check it out yep we got the same output now if you want to explain this in much more in depth to the interviewer you can explain this just the way i explained you so you can start by one parameter you can say that if we provide it two then it's going to return us a function which is going to expect another parameter b and when we provide it b which let's say we provide six that's going to expect another parameter which is c so we're going to provide it the third parameter as well and then we are going to get the final answer which is going to be a plus b plus c all right so our next question is this we need to create a function called evaluate and we provide it a parameter of sum multiply divide or oh, subtract so we can provide this either of these operations and after that we're going to provide it to parameters over here which are going to give us result according to this so if this is sum this is going to add this if this is multiply this is going to multiply this and so on so we're going to go on and create a function over here called evaluate and first thing that is going to be taking is this type of operation so i'm going to give this operation parameter and inside of this this is obviously going to return another function because it because it is expecting another argument so we're going to provide it we're going to return another function which is going to be anonymous function and i'm going to give this let's say a and inside of this it's going to be expecting another parameter so i'm going to return another function which is going to have a parameter b and now inside of this with respect to this operation we're going to give the output so i'm going to check if operation is equals to sum then return a plus b and so on so let me write this quickly just like that otherwise let's return if the none of the operations are there then i'm gonna just gonna return invalid operation cool all right let's try to run this so i'm gonna say evaluate and i'm gonna write sum over here and i'm gonna provide this let's say four and two let's see what do we get oh i need to console log this all right we got six over here let's see we will try to give this multiply okay we got multiply okay, so we, so you can write this actually in some other way as well so i'm gonna create a const uh, mul and i'm gonna provide this evaluate multiply so this is one of the use cases of currying since we have provided this multiply over here this will always perform multiply so you can reuse this n number of times so if i go and console log mul and mult will all obviously will have this function returned to it so we can say three five which should give us 15 and we can reuse it again let's say two and six which should give us 12 so we should have 15 and 12 as an output Yep, just like that. So you see, this is one of the use cases of currying that we initialized our function once with multiply or whatever that we wanted to. So we, we're not initializing it again and again by providing multiply every time we call this. So we just provided it and initialized it once. And now we can use this mul function over here to multiply these numbers again and again. So during the interview, you can explain all of these things to the interviewer and the interviewer will really be impressed. Now our next question is on infinite currying. So what is infinite currying? So interview will ask us to write a function which we can call just like this with n number of parameters. So if you have a function like this sum and we can say one, 
one and two. So this should give us three, but we can also call this function like this. We can add four, five, or we can add n number of parameters after this. And this should be flexible according to the number of parameters and should give us the answer accordingly, which in this case is going to be 12. So how do we do this? So this question was actually asked to me during my cast 24 interview. And I've already discussed in this cast 24 interview experience video. So I'm going to go on and play that clip right here. So the interviewer provided me with this code snippet and he asked me to implement this add function. So let's see how we can implement that. So we create a function called add and it takes a parameter. Let's say a. Okay. So we have a bunch of parameters over here. So it's obviously going to return a function. Then we are going to call that function with another parameter with another parameter. So it, it can go infinite, right? It's not, it's just not that we have to implement it till five, two, four, five, and then that's it because that will be easy, right? So if I, so let me remove this complexity for now, and I'm just going to implement with just two parameters. So this function a, and it's obviously going to return a function. So I'm going to say return function B, let's say, or let's say anonymous function, and it's going to take B and then inside of it, I'm just going to return another function, which will have, let's say a plus B. Okay. Right. So now if we go on and execute this, you're going to see, we get the output as seven. Yep. Just like that. But we don't want that. We don't want this much complexity, right? So we want to create, we want to write a code which works infinitely. So if I, let's say, go on and add four and it over here, th this should adapt to that code. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove this inner function and I'm going to say we have two of these, but then I'm going to check if we have any more params or not. So I'll check if B has a param, then just return this add again. I'm just going to provide the value of A plus B and just continue this. So A plus B and that's it. But if B doesn't have any value inside of it, that means it's coming to an end. So I'm just gonna return A. So let me explain this again to you. So let's say we have five, two, four, eight over here. So first of all, we provided it with the five and it returned us a function. Okay. So then we again called it with two. We called B with the two, but if it's going to check if two is there or not, if there is some value inside of B or not, only then it's going to return the addition. Otherwise it's just going to return the initial five value, the sum of those numbers up until that point. So, okay. So we did have two at that point. So we said, okay, if two is there, then return a plus B. So five plus two was returned. So five plus two, that is seven went inside of this function. So now it's value is seven over here. But then again, it's going to return another function. Then it's going to check if we are calling that function as empty, but no, this is not empty. It has four inside of it. So then again, it's going to check if there's something inside of the B then return a plus B. So at this point, a's value was seven. So it's going to say seven plus four, that is 11. So it's going to pass 11 to that. So this cycle will run again and again and again until we reach this point. So up until this point, the value was 19. So then it's going to have a 19 value over here and it's going to return a function again. And then it's going to check if B has something, but here B doesn't have anything. So it's not going to go inside of it. And it's just going to return a that is 19 from here. So our answer is going to be 19. Yep. We got this output over here. Now the next question that the interviewer can ask you is the difference between currying and partial application. Now, what is this partial application? Let's see. Now you may have start to think that the number of nested functions a curried function has depends on the number of arguments it receives. And yes, that is what makes it a curry. Let's take some example. So if we have a function sum with a and it returns another function, which has B comma C, and then they return a plus B plus C just like that. And this can be called like this. And we provided 10 and then we can call X like this. Let me console log this. Or it can be called as sum. It can be called directly as 
So you get it what I'm trying to explain, right? So it can be called in either of these ways. So you get what I'm trying to explain, right? It can be called in either of this or these ways. So these function expect three arguments and has two nested functions. Unlike our previous version that expects three argument and has three nesting functions. So the first question that we discussed in which the sum had three nesting functions and had three arguments. So that is what our statement was, right? That the number of nested functions a curried function has depends on the number of arguments it received. But in this case, that is not the case. In this case, we have three arguments, but we are only returning two functions over here. So this right here is not currying. We just did a partial application for this sum function. What partial application does is partial application transform a function into another function with small arity. Also, if you don't know arity just means the number of operands or the arguments a function receives. So if we were to write this same function with currying, we would have written it something like this because in this we have three arguments and we are returning three functions. But in this we have three arguments, but we are returning only two function. So that is the difference between currying and partial application. This right here is partial application. Now, in some cases, interviewer can ask you to explain a real world scenario for using currying while developing our web applications. We can actually use currying to manipulate our DOM as well. So let me give you an example right here. And you can give the same example to your interviewer as well. So I'm going to go to the HTML file and I'm going to add another H1 tag over here called hello Piyush. And here it is. Now I'm going to go to our JavaScript file. So right here, I'm going to create a function called update element text, and this is going to take an ID. And inside of this, I'm going to create another function, which will take content. And inside of this, I'm just going to write document dot query selector, and I'm going to provide this the ID hashtag ID. Oops. Just like that dot and I'm going to update the text content to be the content provided right over here. Now what we can do is we since we have an ID over here, oops, I haven't provided the ID. So let me give this ID of heading. Let's take this ID. Now what we can do over here is we can just initialize this function with our ID once and we can update the text of our heading again and again by calling this uh, the function that will be returned from this. So let me show you. So const update header and I'm going to call update element text and I'm going to provide this this heading um, ID. Now we can use this update header again and again every time we want to update the text inside of this heading right over here. So let me show you. I'm just going to call update header right here and I'm going to say hello roadside coder and let's see. Yep. You see, we have updated it or we can write subscribe to roadside coder and you see it has been updated. So yeah, we can use this function again and again in our code according to let's say the condition. If we click on a button, we can call this function again and again. We don't need to use query selector again and again by providing it the ID. We just need to initialize it once and we can use it just like this. So yeah, you can give this answer to your interviewer and they will definitely be impressed and think that you have used currying in your apps before. Now, do you remember in the beginning of this video, I gave you an example on how we can convert a function like this into this. And this is what a curried function is. So how about we write a function called curry, which converts this function into this function. Now, this is the most important question of this video. Now, this question is usually asked during the senior interviews, but can sometimes be asked during junior interviews as well. So let's add a function called curry, which converts a normal function into a curried function. So I'm going to write function curry. And this is obviously going to take a function. So I'm going to provide a function right here. And this is going to return us a curried function, which will look something like this. So I'm going to return curried function or just curried func. So this is going to take all of the arguments of the function in the form of the array. So args right here will be the array of all of the arguments. So what we'll do over here is I'm going to check if function dot length is more than equals to args dot length. 
So that is what currying is, right? If the function dot length is equals to args dot length, because the number of argument has to be the equal to the number of functions returned. So if it's not equal, then what we'll do is this is this is actually our base case to check. If it's not, then we're gonna return a func with args. Else we will return a function which will collect all of the next arguments that are going to be returned to us. Spreading the values of the arguments first and then the next arguments calling the curried func recursively. So let me show you it. It's gonna be a little confusing, but don't worry, I'm gonna explain you after writing this whole thing. So let me write this out first. So return function with all of the next arguments. And instead of this, I'm gonna call this curried func with args and of the next arguments until this becomes more than all of the arguments of function length. So yeah, let's test this out and I'm gonna explain to you after that. So we have a function sum over here and inside this curry function, we're gonna provide this sum function right over here. And the, inside this total sum, we will have this curried func. Now this thing will be a curried function. So I'm gonna call it just like this. So let's see, we should get the output. Oops, I made a mistake over here. So I'm gonna check if args.length is more than equals function dot length. Yeah, now let's see. So yeah, we get this output six. Now let's understand how this whole thing is working. So we've created a function sum over here, right? Which takes four arguments and it calculates the sum for it. Okay. Then we have created a variable total sum over here and we are passing this sum function to this curry implementation that we have done right over here. Okay, cool. Then we're calling this total sum just like this in a curried way. So let's see what's happening. We've provided this one to this. So obviously when we do this, this is going to return us a function, which is going to be this curried func, right? So we have supplied it one, first of all. So one will be supplied to it. Then it goes inside of it. It's going to check args dot length. So args length right now is just one. So let me show you if I go on console log and I'm going to say args dot length. And I'll also do func dot length. Oops. First time the number of arguments were one and length of the function was four. That is these four functions. Second time the length of argument was two, then three, then four. And the moment the number of argument exceeded, it's gonna call this function right over here with all of the arguments. So I'm gonna explain you as we move along. So let's do this step by step. So I'm gonna comment this line now. So yeah, first time we have called it with this one. So it's gonna check args dot length. So args dot length right now is one, obviously. It's not more than the function dot length. So it's not gonna go inside of it. And it's gonna go over here. Now this is gonna call this curried func over here recursively. So what this will do is, this will return us a function expecting next arguments. So if I remove this for now and run this, you're gonna see that it returns us another function which is expecting the next arguments because obviously the criteria for this is not satisfied. Currying means the number of arguments should be equal to number of functions and the number of function has to be four. Since the number of arguments are four, the number of functions are also supposed to be four. Only then this is going to run. So if we provide it another, let's say six, then again, it's going to expect the next argument because then it's gonna go over here with six and now args.length is two. So over here, it's gonna check args.length two is not more than function dot length. Okay, so it's not gonna go over here. It's gonna come again over here. So in the case of third argument as well, it's going to again expect you to supply the next functions. But the moment we supply it with the fourth arguments, what it's going to do, it's gonna take all of these and provide it to this sum function. That is this function right over here. And when we run this, you're gonna see we have successfully calculated the sum for all four of these. Now you can write any function over here and this is going to make it a curried function. This is how much powerful this function is. Now I know this is a little bit confusing to you, but try to rewind the video and rewatch my explanation that I did just now. You'll be able to understand it properly. So yeah, that was currying in JavaScript. And if you like this video, give this video a huge fat thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more such awesome interview videos.